Good afternoon and welcome to Exploring the Fundamental Building Blocks of a Successful EPCS Program, a Health System CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by Improvada. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO and I will be your moderator today. We're looking forward to some audience participation. You can send in your questions and comments at any time in the Q&A box and leave the default. Set. Oh, I'm sorry, forget about that. Um, send them in at any time. We'll take them later in the program. And we're going to do a little poll that we think is fun, and we'll have our panelists guess at the results. So we always enjoy that. Uh, to get into a nice viewing mode today, uh, click in the top center, get it into side-by-side -side mode. Then you can adjust the divider, slide that to where you want to get the slides in the video boxes a nice size. And you, it should say speaker view in the top right-hand corner. Just so you can see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to about 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Dr. Dick Taylor, Chief Clinical Informatics Officer with BJC Healthcare, Dr. Stephanie Lahr, CIO and CMIO at Monument Health, and Dr. Sean Kelly, Chief Medical Officer with Improvada. So let's jump right in. Lots to talk about with our great panel. Uh, Dick, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. I'm the Chief Clinical Informatics Officer for HIP, the Health Information Partners uh, combination of VJC Healthcare and Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, so I uh, oversee the uh, EHR implementation of the EHR and things that attach to it, um, among uh, other general informatics responsibilities. Excellent. Thanks, Dick. Stephanie? Morning. Thanks. So I am the CIO and CMIO at Monument Health. As you mentioned, Monument Health is a not-for-profit healthcare system serving Western South Dakota, some of Eastern Wyoming, and Northern Nebraska. Uh, I've been in the CIO role for a couple of years, came here about four years ago as the CMIO and, and then decided it wasn't um, enough fun to just do the medical informatics part and decided to take on the CIO role as well. So super excited for this discussion. This is a great topic. Excellent. Sean? Thanks, Anthony. And uh, hey, Dick and uh, Stephanie, nice to see you. Uh, my name's Sean Kelly. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Improvada. I've been there approximately nine plus years now. Run a team of practicing clinicians. We help with clinical workflows, make sure we optimize those out at our customer sites, uh, you know, get feedback and share best practices, including around EPCS. Um, uh, just one of uh, my biggest interests out there um, because I'm also an ER physician in Boston at Beth Israel Leahy. So I see a lot of the effects of the opioid crisis firsthand and it's a particular area of interest of mine. Looking forward to the discussion. Very good. Thanks, Sean. All right. First question, Stephanie, let's start with you. Aside from regulatory considerations, which we will get to, talk about the challenges associated with pre prescribing controlled substances manually. Yeah, I mean, some of this depends kind of how far back you want to go. Um, and in certain states, some of these things are still in place. But, you know, controlled substances, it, it, through all the best efforts of trying to make sure that we're managing where they're going and to whom well, and that the um, that the prescriptions are truly authenticated, obviously there are extra steps in place to to validate all those things. And and so then for a long time, it literally meant having you know a special piece of paper or triplicate potentially piece of paper um, elements of which had to be distributed to different locations um, and entities to, to monitor what we were doing. So what it really meant was for both the provider and the patient, if you couldn't have some sort of face-to-face -face interaction, the controlled substance prescription that you might need was something that became very difficult um, for us to be able to, to help a patient um, get when they needed it. And, and also, again, because it was all on paper, made it very difficult for us to track who was getting what, when, and whether it was appropriate for them to be getting more um, and those kinds of things. So, you know, it's, it's the, the challenges of a, of a paper-based world that we had um, and the tri trials and tribulations of monitoring through that and being able to leverage newer technology to be able to overcome those things has is, is been really powerful. Very good. Um, Sean? 
Yeah, um, in addition to some of the issues that, that Stephanie was talking about, I think um, it's worth keeping in mind the hassle to patients, um, the dissatisfaction for, you know, controlled substances aren't just opioids, but you think about things like um, patients with ADD and ADHD, you've got some poor mom or dad who every so often needs to literally show up to a pediatrician's office just to get a piece of paper that they then need to drag over to the pharmacy and oh by the way this is in the setting of having a child with ADD or ADHD and not the best of scenarios for someone to have to come in to pick up a piece of paper and bring it into a pharmacy and hand it in and wait or even if you call ahead sometimes it's not ready and sitting there and waiting um, just crazy archaic workflows especially as e-prescribing of other substances came about and got incredible adoption you had this weird dichotomy where you had everybody in, in the healthcare world starting to adopt electronic prescribing, except when they needed it most, with the medicines that were actually the most powerful and the riskiest for uh, you know, diversion and abuse, which is just a crazy scenario. So I like to talk about workflows, not just for providers and for administrators, but oh, by the way, patients and family, because that's why we're all here. So I just, I'd like to point that out. Sean, why do you th why do you think it came about like that? Why do you think that the focus was on the uh, the non controlled substances first? Uh, security concerns around uh, controlled substances. So the DEA back in 2011, I believe, put in an interim final rule and said essentially you're, that places are allowed to prescribe electronically for controlled substances, but if you did so, you had to hit a very high bar for security. So that's the right thing to do. You have to be very careful if you're putting an electronic system in place that it's secure, that you know it's non-reputable. There's no, there's no doubt that I actually wrote that prescription and, and authenticated in the system. If someone else can do that and there's an audit of that, then you know that, that is really risky for everybody involved. And so the standards were set pretty high um, early on, and that was difficult before technology matured to catch up to be able to do that. There are now good vendors and good products out there that really actually make electronic prescribing not only the safe and compliant thing to do, but it's actually easier than doing it on paper due to a lot of kind of fancy technology we have now. So it was, I won't say artificially delayed, it was delayed because the technology and the processes needed to mature mm -hmm. uh, to catch up and allow it to happen because it's just more stringent when you're talking about those medicines that are you know, high risk, high reward. Very good, Dick, your thoughts? Yeah, so I'll, I want to address Sean's comments first. Uh, the, I think that the challenge was that in 2011, the DEA came out and they prioritized uh, avoiding front end diversion, that is avoiding prescription foraging and washing over everything. And so they, they came up with something which they thought would make it nearly impossible to forge and, and otherwise uh, misauthor a prescription and they weren't wrong the problem was they made it impossible to write one. And so for, you know, I, I've, I've been in informatics for more than 20 years and I will say that uh, the, in, in 2010, when we looked at that or 2011, when we looked at the interim final rule, we sort of said, yeah, this could happen, but we didn't try it. We, we literally made no effort to go there. And it was because it was nearly impossible. Um, as Sean said, technology has moved forward. Uh, we have a number of options. And so, you know, now we can actually stand up an EPCS program uh, where before it was really very difficult, but that's why it happened. I also think, uh, and I really want to echo one of Sean's points, the primary value uh, is in, in getting rid of manual prescribing is not getting rid of forgery or fraud. That is a value, but the primary value is that electronic prescribing is so much easier for patients and so much easier for providers that, uh, you know, doing it the old fashioned way, the, the, uh, the you know, a typed piece of paper. It's not. It's not handwritten anymore. You know, we all do it out of our EHR. But then, requiring in the age of COVID, you have to come in. You have to deal with infection risk. You have to, you know, a lot of these patients that have have pain medications are mobility challenged. So you have to work all that out just to get that piece of paper, so that you can then uh, schlep it yourself over to the uh, the pharmacy. Um, it's a uh, it's it's a huge dissatisfier for patients, and it's one that uh, EPCS gets us past. So it, it it's that to me is the major challenge we're 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 addressing. Excellent points. Very good. 
Um, next question, Sean, let's start with you. Um, talk about the, the regulatory considerations. I mean, there's the nice to do, there's the it's good for everyone to do, but then there's the hard and fast of what you have to do. Um, so what can you tell us about what's going on? You, you know, we talked about the 2011. What's going on now from a regulatory perspective? And I know there's a dichotomy between the federal and the state, right? And it depends, obviously, what state you're in. But what can you tell us? Well, uh, let's start with the state um, level because um, state by state, uh, a number of states have already enacted ePCS mandates. And so by law, not only can e-prescribing be done for controlled substances, but in many states now, um, it's in the high 20s, uh, it actually is mandated that it has to happen um, electronically or pharmacies cannot fill um, those prescriptions unless they have a waiver for certain subset of conditions uh, through hardship or technology going down or something like that. And so the large majority of states now have passed mandates making it required to do electronic prescribing of controlled substances and not just printing or handwriting uh, prescriptions. So there's a strong regulatory component on the, um, on the state level that's uh, driving a lot of hospitals. Although, you know, to, to Dick's point and to, for us as a vendor, what we saw was in many cases, this, these mandates gave hospital systems the excuse they were looking for to actually enact what they were already trying to do, which was to make it all electronic to begin with. So I just wanna say that there are mandates and I'll talk about the federal things in a minute, um, but far and away what we hear and what I've experienced myself um, on the hospital side is patient safety, provider safety and satisfaction, you know, accountability, and then the mandates are lower down. Um, that said, the mandates are important and the regulations are obviously important and one must be in compliance with that. So um, there are two other aspects of this. Um, one is the federal um, piece that you talked about. And so um, what happens there is that the, the feds aren't mandating that EPCS happens, but to be reimbursed through Medicare uh, for an electronically pre prescribed controlled substance um, by January of this upcoming year, it has to be done electronically. And so effectively what they're saying is you have to do it electronically because very few in their right mind are going to write prescriptions by paper that cannot be reimbursed um, for the patient and for the care plan and, the care plan and providers. Um, so what, what the feds have essentially done is said, look, you know, by, by this time, it really all needs to be uh, electronic. Um, and at the same time, what we saw was um, major players in the industry, um, you know, like Walmart saying, um, we need to have it electronically as well, because on the industry and the pharmacy filling side, they're also realizing that it's not only more efficient and better, but safer for compliance and having an audit trail to have it electronic. So three major prongs, uh, state mandates, the federal reimbursement, um, and regulation and industry itself. Um, and then those, but to Dick's point, those are all secondary to patient interest and provider side desire to actually do the right thing in the right way um, properly. Dick, what's going on where you are in terms of regulatory things pushing you along? So we've got a couple of things. Uh, in the state of Missouri, um, we have an absolute mandate starting on one one twenty one for electronic prescribing of controlled substances. We also have the federal mandate. Uh, we work in Illinois as well. So uh, BGC and Washington University are, are a two state uh, system. And uh, Illinois, is, Illinois doesn't have the state mandate, but they have the uh, federal mandate. When it comes right down to it, we're an integrated healthcare delivery system. And so we will, we, we have an absolute date of 1121. Um, and that's really, it's changed some things. As Sean said, it's the right thing to do anyway, but, um, where we're sitting, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a, a happy confluence between doing the right thing and being told to do the right thing. And uh, so we're making sure that we, that we meet that. Um, and uh, the regulatory pressures give us a, give us a, a very useful uh, lever, but in the end, uh, the electronic prescribing is something that we want desperately to do anyway. Uh, Dick, it sounds like the, this, you know, we've heard a few times already about this useful lever type thing and that the regulations are helpful in a sense and I'm guessing they're helpful in two ways but you tell me one would be um, change is hard for everyone so this this gives those like yourself that have to push the change through 
something to back you up. You know, it's not just me, right? Uh, and also getting the resources um, to do it because there's dollars probably that have to go behind this. So just uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, so the dollars aren't trivial. Uh, it does cost money to do this kind of a thing. We have to touch every one of several thousand providers and make sure that they're properly identity proofed and, and uh, enrolled. Um, and that's uh, that's always been a, a, an issue, but it's not the primary issue. You know, our health system, like many, uh, believes in the patient experience and believes in in uh, in providers uh, having the best possible tools. Um, on the other hand, it it also allows us to achieve near uh, near perfect uh, adoption among providers, and that can be harder. Um, uh, Sean and I have known each other for a long time, and, and in previous e uh, EPCS implementations. Um, we've found providers who uh, really didn't want to change their practices. They were comfortable where they were. They, uh, they practiced good medicine uh, or, or they practiced what they believed was good medicine and they didn't want to move. And, and this really, the regulatory pressures really allow us to say completely accurately and without being in any way manipulative, you don't have a choice. We, we have to move forward here. Um, we're going to make it as easy and productive as we can, but in terms of the change management, yeah, this this creates the burning platform or the or the perceived need that otherwise might be a lot harder to uh, to get full adoption of. Stephanie, two I, issues. Sorry, uh, two issues to... to you: the the regulatory um, angle of where you are, the the and the idea of political will, and then what I interrupted you from saying. So why don't you start with that, okay, and sure. then we'll go to the other two things. Um. So uh, political will is strong in South Dakota. Um, we have, interestingly, um, we're, you know, we're a small state, we have a small board of pharmacy, um, a small medical board, and, um, and so we actually do not have a state mandate um, that is upcoming, but the philosophy is we know the federal mandate is there and we absolutely believe it's the right thing to do. And so um, I think, you know, to Sean's point earlier, some of the states that wanted to get out in front of this, some states have had this in place um, well before this upcoming January that it's been a requirement. And those states that were, were able and willing to do that, having a, a state requirement, you know, sort of allowed them to do things faster than what the national requirement was going to be. But we are definitely as an organization um, moving our providers and educating them on the federal require requirement that is coming up and making sure that we have the right tools in place to support that because the majority of our patients in reality, you know, have, um, have public payer, and even when they don't, the private payers are soon to follow. So it, it will only be a very short matter of time, I'm sure. Um, the other element that I was going to bring into the, the question that you asked about potentially the benefit of regulation is on the vendor side of things. So Sean mentioned earlier, um, and Dick did too, that back in the early days of the discussions of EPCS, and in the early days of any of the technology um, kinds of tools that we're trying to bring into an inform healthcare informatics arena, they tend to be... Um, you know, a, a little bit clunky to begin with. And our providers over the last 10 years in particular have a lot of experience dealing with immature tools that we are trying to, um, the intentions are phenomenal, where we're trying to get to and what we're gonna do with them eventually are phenomenal, but the technology, um, the requirements, the um, all the hoops that the vendors have to jump through, et cetera, as well as the various different things they're focused on, sometimes leads us to having to adopt tools that are, are not quite ready for prime time. And so when we have regulatory alignment with what is um, what we all really want to do, the great thing that happens there as well is uh, folks like Improvada do a great job of then being able to align their resources with making sure that the tools that we're going to roll out are um, are the of the highest quality and standard, so that we don't have as many of those physicians who say, "Gosh, I'd really like to just keep doing it the way I am." Or if they do take that initial approach, when the physician in the office next to them is rocking and rolling with EPCS, they're like, "Wow, what 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 you doing over there? Okay, maybe I can be a believer," and and creating those believers comes from having really good tools that make it easy to do the right thing that we want to do. So I think there is there was benefit from the regulatory um, mandate from that perspective as well. 
I Excellent. completely agree with that. That's it's a really good point that by pushing our vendors and by clarifying the regulatory environment for them, it made it possible to get good tools and get them in the hands of the providers. Excellent. Very good. All right, next question, Dick, we're going to start with you. If an organization has decided it should or must move towards EPCS, what are some first steps? So uh, I guess there's sort of three things I, I look at. The, the first is decide whether you're really in this or not. Um, EPCS isn't something you can put a toe in the water and say, oh, let's do a few providers and see how it goes. And the problem is that so much of the infrastructure has to support a wide community. You have to get all the pharmacies. Uh, uh, you have to understand, you have to get your databases set up. You've got to understand where the patients are going. So it's hard to do it a little bit. And you need to say, are we ready to go at scale or not? If you're not, then you need to consider why not and, and how you can get there. But for my, in my experience and for my, for my money, you need to plan to go at scale. The second thing I think you need to do is to understand who are your providers? Where are they? who prescribes. And some providers are going to be hard to get, but you don't mind because they essentially prescribe no controlled substances. Use your EHR, but really understand the provider community. Understand where your pain docs are, where your ED docs are. They're your high hitters and target them, prepare to target them effectively. And that's the third thing is really put together a game plan and don't take forever at this. This is not something that you want to say, um, okay, we're going to do a two-year plan. By the end of two years, we're going to have everybody up. There's kind of a sweet spot, and it's probably not a week's worth of implementation, but it's certainly not a year's. And uh, you, should be, you should plan. This is, a, this is a transformative event for a health system. So use it. Plan it. Um, the great thing is provider satisfaction tends to be very high. Patient satisfaction tends to be very high. This is a happy event. So, uh, you know, you need to plan to embrace that and move forward quickly. Very interesting. Don't take forever. I think that's something that uh, a very interesting point that we could look into a little more. Uh, Stephanie, your thoughts on first steps? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in, in change management strategies, it's always super important to help understand the why. Um, and to be perfectly honest, leading with regulatory is usually not the right way to go. Um, leading with regulatory suggests to your constituency that you don't really have a good reason to be doing what you're doing, but we're doing it because we have to. Um, that to me is, it, it's the piece you can use at the end for the recalcitrant who just won't make a move. But a lot of people are willing, nobody wants to spend more time or ha be less efficient or not have their patients have a, a higher quality experience. They are nervous, afraid, um, don't understand. And so those are the pieces, I think, a really strong communication strategy led by clinical leadership, not technology leadership, even not clinical leadership in technology. The best people to be at the forefront of this are your medical staff leaders, your VPMAs, your, um, your, your chairs of departments, et cetera, because they work with their clinical teams all the time and they, um, when, when they lead by the example, it gets people on board. So I, you need to have a strong messaging campaign and you need to get the right clinical leaders involved. So Stephanie, just to follow up on that a little bit, you know, the positions of chief medical information officer exist to have that arm of IT that can has cr uh, credibility with the clinical team. But what you're saying is that's not even good enough in this case. You actually have to get a clinician, not someone who's somewhat embedded in technology. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the CMIO role is certainly is not the same everywhere. Um, but the reality is um, everyone sees, most people, most clinicians see the CMIO as, a, you know, definitely that person who um, helps navigate the, the waters of how we best integrate these things. But they know that the person that's in that role has a specific direction and focus and understanding and sometimes even a greater propensity for adoption. And so mm -hmm. they still are, appear sometimes to be a little bit different than just my average, you know, pediatrician sitting next to me in the office or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think when, when they are clinical initiatives, um, a clinician that's in IT, I mean, I'll be honest, for my organization, 
I led this with my uh, ambulatory MIO who works for me. And we led this because there wasn't anybody else to do it. And, and we were successful and I think, and, and it, it worked. Um, but if I was you know, gonna give advice to somebody else, I think it's even better when these kinds of things are going on, if you can have um, that, that truly operational champion. They, they really help describe and, and get the why across on an everyday basis in a different way than somebody who is seen as the IT doctor. Excellent. Very good. Sean? So I, of course, agree with both Dick and Stephanie. Um, th there's a way to do this right. Um, being pragmatic is really important. Um, I was at a conference, uh, this was years ago, where the person was talking about how doctors and nurses didn't like technology. There's a lot of grumbling in the audience. And he's like, how many of you have a smartphone? And everyone raised their hand. And he's like, how many have two smartphones? And most people raise both hands. So the point being, doctors and nurses, they actually don't hate technology. They love technology. They just hate bad technology. So there's a playbook here. Change management is a huge part of it. Leadership is a big part of it. Leading from the field is a big part of it. And it, it may be assumed, but intrinsic to all of this is you have to have good technology. And there's a big separator between good or great technology here and really bad technology because you know, we as clinicians have had good technology very you know, sporadically and we've had bad technology shoved down our throat a lot. Um, and we gag back up on that, we hate it um, and, and we fight back. Um, so, you know, if you come at me as, as an ER doc, if you come at me and say, I have something that you need to use due to some mandate or it's, you know, it's going to make your life better. You might as well be, you know, talking about aliens and unicorns or something, right? Like it's, it's not what we, we're not hearing it. We're not hearing it. Like we need to know and we need to see just how good it is. So part of the whole process is really letting this get out there organically, you have a demo that shows how good this is. And as Dick said earlier, like it actually is an improvement in workflow as well as safety and regulatory. Without that improvement in workflow, we, we work around it, we fight it, it doesn't happen. One way or another, we fight it. Yeah, I, uh, I think that- Go ahead, Dick. So, uh, Stephanie said something I wanna, wanna comment on briefly, and that's the role of the CMIO. CMIOs are enablers. They, in their, their best function is I can make this possible for you. Their worst function is I'm telling you, you have to do it. Because no one will take a CMIO's word for that, but they will if you can open the door, if, the, if, if medical clinical leadership opens the door, the CMIO makes it possible. And that's really, you know, so I've seen a lot of CMIOs uh, run these, these initiatives but I've never seen them run them successfully without strong clinical backing from the very top of the organization. All right, very good. Um, next question is right here. <clears throat> Stephanie, let's start with you. What are some considerations around the budget that must be allotted for the project and the people hours that must be dedicated to there's, it. There's so. the obvious things that you have to think about from a budget, uh, budgetary standpoint, and then there are some less obvious things. So when it comes to the obvious, obviously you're gonna buy some, some hardware and some software in order to, to make this work. Which hardware you're gonna buy from which company and software is obviously a decision that has to be made. But then even beyond that, what methodology? There's several different ways that you can do this and make it easy for users. You've got fingerprint readers, you've got other kinds of um, biometric or um, um, geosensing or a message that comes to your phone. Some of these are devices that an organization is gonna pay for. And some of these are, are devices that you may be asking your providers to bring themselves. You need to know ahead of time what that landscape looks like. Because if your plan is that everyone's gonna use their own device, 
And then you find that that is not the willingness of your, your medical staff or your, your providers to do that. You will now have a big budgetary gap and it's honestly probably quite unlikely that you're gonna go straight that direction. So you, you need to be thinking about what's the strategy for how I'm going to interact with the EPCS um, system and, and what I need to buy in order to do that. So um, another piece that I wanna highlight that I think for us was, was interesting you know, there's some significant workflow considerations and things that change when this happens. When I write a prescription on a piece of paper, it doesn't matter what pharmacy you're planning to go to. In fact, you could be driving to a pharmacy, go into their parking lot, decide it's overcrowded and drive up the street and go to a completely different branded pharmacy. That doesn't work with EPCS or any, you know, e-prescribing. We need to know what pharmacy. Well, whose job is it to put that pharmacy in the computer system and make sure that it's, it's set to the right one? And is this the pharmacy that you wanna use for EPCS? Or is this the pharmacy that you use for your cardiac medicine, but not for your, your controlled substance medication? So there's, there's workflow considerations and that then comes into project hours and the people who need to be dedicated to being a part of the project as it is all developed to make sure that once it's turned on, that it all flows the way that it needs to. Because again, even now that we have really great technology, if we're not using the technology in a workflow that makes sense, it will still be seen as a failure. So probably those are just a couple of comments and I'll, I'll open it up to both Dick and Sean to see if they have additional thoughts on, on budget and man hour kinds of allocations. Yeah, so everything you said, Stephanie, and I completely agree with us, and especially do not underestimate the amount of budget you will spend on workflow redesign and identifying who's gonna collect that information. The other thing is uh, physicians are terrible at picking pharmacies. They don't necessarily know where patients go. They, they don't necessarily know who's got the most congenial store. The patient knows, but often you need to set up a workflow. You need to say, look, at triage, we're going to ask. At, uh, at uh, registration, we're going to ask. You got to think about that. So there's workflow redesign. Um, there's just a lot of grunt work involved in getting hold of the physicians and identity proofing them, getting them enrolled with the, with the tokens. That's probably the single biggest piece of, of labor that, that we've had. The, if, if, you, if you go at scale, um, it's relatively simple to uh, to I, um, set the, the systems up. Um, it's relatively simple to grant access in the in the uh, EHR. In, in a previous life, we we enrolled uh, 1,500 providers at one time, uh, or rather, granted access to 1,500 providers at one time uh, using the services of uh, two two uh, informaticians and one large pizza. Um, that's the kind of a thing that you can do. Um, what you can't do is go out to every one of those clinics. And uh, when I was, when I was uh, in, a, in a previous life, we, it was a very rural organization and you had to drive half an hour to get to the clinics. And, uh, and then you would identity proof three physicians and then you would do that again. And, and those, that's not free and, and the labor has to be accounted for. Um, the other thing is uh, don't forget to account for change management. Um, Stephanie's exactly right. You have to make the case and you have to make the case in multiple venues. So you have to make sure that you allocate adequate time. Um, and uh, time is budget, so you have to make sure that you do that. Uh, Sean, what's, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I um, want to just add a couple points. First to, to Stephanie's comment and then yours about the, the picking the, the pharmacy and the workflows and the processes. Um, I think it is essential to rethink your, the processes of your workflow, but it's actually an opportunity to improve them. Um, and so like I, I work in the ER, so you're absolutely correct. It's completely um, difficult to, to sort out exactly which pharmacy you should pick. And what first sounds straightforward is not when you start thinking about factors like, you know, um, someone comes in at even 2 p.m. on a Sunday Yep. And you assume that they can get to their pharmacy, but it turns out their ride doesn't show up till four and they don't quite make it till the five o'clock closing time. And so, you know, do you pick the pharmacy of their choosing or do you default to a local 24 seven pharmacy or, and this is where you get to the improvement. We've had multiple hospitals say, well, 
we've been trying to drive business to our own pharmacy because we know we can stay on formulary. We know the patient can get it. If there's any problems, they're still on site. And so they use this as a great excuse to say, you know what, we're opening our own retail pharmacy in our four doors. And when that person walks out, they hook a left, they grab their medicines. If there's any problem, we still have them here and they're completely happy and well cared for. And we know they picked up their medicine. And so I think this is, look, if you can't draw it out on paper, then be careful about accelerating things electronically. So this is the opportunity, like, like Dick said, once you're in, you're all in. Like right. figure out what the process is, figure out where the problems are, know that there will be change management issues and then you know, map it out and execute, you know, iterate and, and improve again. Um, so I guess that was, um, that was a major part. And then um, when Dick was talking about credentialing, because that's what the, EPC, uh, the DEA talks about, getting their providers ready, right? It's confusing because we talk about credentialing to talk about right. a number of other things too, but identity proofing um, providers, uh, the DEA was very convoluted and, and, and it, it sort of, it really was like it needed to happen in person for a long time. And recently yep. the DEA clarified that, and this was during the COVID-19 pandemic, they clarified that this could actually happen uh, remotely. So you could do a Zoom experience like this, as long as you have the correct software in place and the, the correct sign-offs in place, there's a way to do it uh, remotely, which is, I think, an incredible improvement on some of those processes, especially for places where you have a big rural component or it's very, you know, geographically disparate uh, practices. So, um, you know, we continue to refine this both on the vendor side and on the um, provider side. To continue to improve both the processes and then how it dovetails into the technology to make sure that there's good. What we're going to do is we're going to quickly throw out the audience poll that I'm launching right now. So if you want to take a look at that and answer that, we'd really appreciate it. Considering, uh, uh, considering the benefits of EPCS, policy leaders are moving too slowly in their timelines to require adoption. So if you think they're moving too slowly and things should be going quicker, um, then you agree with that. Otherwise, you disagree. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, I want to get an audience question out there. Now we have a question from the audience. Why aren't the audit trails on electronic prescription of non-controlled substances adequate to cover the needs of controlled substances? Yeah, I can, I can feel that first. Um, so um, all electronic prescriptions, there's some form of tracking of that, but there's an there's a entirely um, more stringent uh, restriction and audit um, requirements according to the DEA for any controlled substances. So um, there's, yes, there's tracking for e-prescription in general, but the stakes are much higher for um, controlled substances because of the potential for addiction and harm and diversion and abuse. And so that involves multiple things like the proper um, identification and credentialing that, that Dick referred to. And it also, there, there needs to be constant tracking of exactly who authorized prescriptions for which patients and when that happened. And the DEA also requires things like if someone tries multiple times to log in as Sean Kelly unsuccessfully, that could be someone trying to break into the system. So there are certain things that need to be reported within 24 hours to the, the DEA. And so there are a number, and we can touch base with anyone offline if they'd like to, and we can actually send you to the, to the interim final rule where you can see all these things expounded upon. But just understand there's a baseline level of security, and then for anything controlled, there's a whole world of other stuff that needs to happen. Dick, do you have any yeah. yeah, so I mean, really, it, it is about the EA sensitivity to uh, forging and diversion. Um, for example, um, the uh, DEA requires that when you send a prescription to a pharmacy, it travel with an electronic signature such that it cannot be diverted to a different pharmacy. Uh, organizations that uh, have wanted to, for example, prioritize their own pharmacy and have redirected prescriptions have, have uh, run, run afoul of this uh, unintentionally. But the fact is, if you send it to the Walgreens on 9th, it's going to the Walgreens on 9th. And that's a really important piece. Um, the other piece is, uh, you know, the, uh, the audit controls on, uh, on non-controlled substances 
um, come from come outside of the DEA's purview. So the DEA doesn't have jurisdiction over non-controlled substances in the same in the same way. Um, and that means that uh, they are allowed to have tighter rules, and so we're going to have kind of two sets of rules. So in some senses, it's a jurisdictional question as well. Stephanie, anything on that? No, I think well said and, and um, nothing to add. All right, another audience question. Aren't all prescriptions quote unquote controlled substances in that they require prescriptions to acquire and must be tracked? Okay. Uh, no, uh, or, or rather, yes and no. Yes, all uh, the, the prescribing authority is restricted to uh, to legally authorized prescribers in every state. Um, controlled is a special word, and it's a it's a special word that implies that they've been placed on a schedule of controlled substances by federal rule, and uh, that that includes medications that you're not allowed to prescribe at all. The so-called uh, C ones but it also includes all of the other controlled substances. So yes, prescribing itself is a controlled activity, but no, the word controlled is actually a, sort of a special word in this case. All right, very good. We're gonna go back to our poll and we're gonna guess at our results before we reveal them. So um, Stephanie, let's start with you. What percentage of people agree with our statement there? Um. I, I mean, I, I think given the timeline we're on and the amount of work that we've talked about that it really takes to make this happen successfully, I, I think it's going to be low. I, I think maybe it's 25. 25%. All right, Sean? 60%. Mm. 60%. You got to come down on the other side of it just for the heck of it. <laughs> If, if you'd asked if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said eighty percent. I'm going to say I, I'm going to say thirty percent, because frankly, the timelines right now are very short. Wow, the highest well, without you, going you, over. Who wins? It, it, am I only? Do I only win if it's less than twenty five? Yeah. Wait. What are the rules? Should I have bid one dollar yes. to not overbid the show? <laughs> exactly. I think we're showing our age here. What do yeah. I win? Listen. Here's the deal. If it had been a year ago, Dick would have been almost perfect. Okay, 82% agree. 82% really? agree. But that does mean that for today, Sean is the winner. Well done, Sean. Wow. Awesome. Well done. You get a stuff I, I, answered, I answered that poll 142 times, by the way. So. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well done. This election is All right, let's do, yeah, let's do our Ask a Co-Panelist feature. Sean, I'm going to give you a shot to ask your co-panelist a question. Okay. Co-panelists, how important or how excited would you be about uh, passwordless authentication? Any kind of biometric or other authentication for EPCS? I would be super Definitely. excited about that. Um, I mean, passwords are the becoming really the bane of all of our existence. And to be honest, they're uh, wearing my CIO a cybersecurity hat, they're, they're actually really almost starting to work against us because the reality is so many things are now password protected. We're all doing things to find shortcuts to managing our passwords. So what are we doing when we're managing our passwords in that way? We're creating vulnerability. So something that I always have, can't alter and don't have to remember, two thumbs up. So yeah. I, I I agree uh, with a caveat. The, the, I agree completely. Passwords are awful. Uh, they, are the, they are the worst tool that you can use except for all of the others in many cases. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, uh, the ch one issue is we still have not handled the, the question of, uh, for example, biometric uh, duplication, biometric theft, and the, the fact that biometrics are themselves non-repudiatable. So you can't say, uh, you can change your password, but you can't change your fingerprint. And if somebody finds a way to duplicate your fingerprint, either electronically or physically, um, it becomes a significant challenge. So I think that uh, I am very much in favor of it. I also believe that we have to manage the technology side of it. Very good. Stephanie, you have a question for your co-panelists. So my question, I had a question for Sean first, which is, 
sort of related to um, maybe what he was asking us, which is what do you think the, the next steps are in making EPCS even more um, easy and workflow helpful, et cetera, than it is today? Uh, that question's way too easy for me, Stephanie. So literally as we speak coming out is the ability to do uh, remote EPCS, which I'm really excited about. So until this point, the DEA has been um, not allowing easy remote uh, workflows because the one of the DEA uh, restrictions is you can't generate a one-time pin, you know, like an app on your phone that gives you a, a manual, you guys both use these, but a manual push um, or, or a manual entry or a push token notification. You can't do that on the same device that you're prescribing from. Um, it's not secure enough. And so we're just now coming out with and Epic is gonna, gonna, gonna actually now provide the ability and other vendors may also of letting their native apps actually allow prescribers to from the same device. So on my iPhone, I can actually just prescribe a controlled substance because there's another way to do that token in the cloud. And then eventually we're gonna look at biometrics and other things too. So the bottom line is it's becoming possible soon, if not already. I just don't know exactly what's released yet and what's not, but it's becoming soon um, very easy to do uh, remote um, EPCS from a single device, which is how we want to use it, right? If I'm right now, if I need to prescribe something, I can, you know, if I can pick up my iPhone and just do it and complete it, that's a whole different thing than having to have a second device and then go to my other computer and this and that. So uh, sorry for a long-winded answer, but basically um, mobile. I love that Stephanie, answer. you have a different question for Dick. So I wanted to ask Dick, um, as we were talking about kind of rollout strategy and, and this sort of, you know, there's, there's big bang, there's pilot and following. I heard him sort of say, he definitely don't drag it out. My experience was um, this was something though that was good to sort of do in a location based sort of rolling strategy and i just wonder you know do you do you still agree do you would you also agree with sort of a rolling strategy knowing that you're going to run into some slight workflow variations some slight potentially hardware variations and things like that location to location or do you think this is something that people really should be considering doing as a big bang obviously organization size is, is dependent but on that but just want your thoughts on that yeah so the first thing is anything that works is acceptable. Uh, the, the question is the question is not what is the only way to do it. Um, I do think that uh, most of the time, uh, and again, this may simply reflect the organizations that I work for. Most of the time, pilots become an excuse to to take longer than a lot of people would like. When I think about patients, and I and I look at the way patients respond to it, um, if you have physicians who are covering for each other, and some of them are e-prescribing and some of them are not, that's actually really challenging for patients. If you have, um, if you if you can go geography by geography, or you can go, um, you know, physician group by physician group, you kind of have to for some of this. And then the question is, at what point do you bring things live, and at what point are you then, um, you know, catching up versus what are you doing beforehand, and then bringing the whole thing live? But I do think that uh, that you have to be a, you have to avoid the perpetual pilot, and you have to avoid the uh, the um, you know waiting waiting for it to to rain stars from heaven before you move it forward, be, because again it's going to be one of those things that uh, that uh, this is such a this is such a good thing to do that it's something that uh, organizations need to to really bias themselves towards scale. Dick, did you have a question for your co-panelists? Yeah. Um, What's going to prevent us from completely ending paper prescriptions in this country? Stephanie, I'll start with you. Um, well, I'd like to say nothing, uh, but I, I feel like that's probably not true because we're still doing a lot of faxing. So if we use faxing <laughs> as a corollary, um, you know, and some of the reason we're using faxing is is difficulty in in change management and expense and things like that. But but some of it is there are workflows and situations that are sometimes difficult 
to replicate and represent in an electronic way um, where you have some flexibility that you just may not have, um, you know, with paper that you may ha may not have electronically. So, um, I, you know, I think about um, really remote geographies. Um, I think about, um, I, I just feel like there's potentially a handful of workflows. I, 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 I think it's the right thing to do, but I think there may be some limitations for some different places for a while that I, I don't I don't think it's right around the corner. For example, I don't see the mandate happening in January and we're obsolescent on paper by February or probably even January of next year. I think there are going to be some nuances that are probably not even going to fully come to light until we sort of say you can't do that anymore. And then people are great about coming up with the, well, but I have this situation and how would I do this electronically? It doesn't really work the same. Sean? Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think there'll be a long tail where it'll continue to just gradually, you know, get a little more, um, you know, down towards zero. But being in the ER too, I, I do see that there's an upside to having like a downside procedure um, of just having at least one backup and paper can be that backup. Um, but other than that, I would like to see it uh, go away as much as possible. And I think, you know, other than culture change, the issue is definitely around some of the smaller practices, mom and pop shops, where it's just harder to, to implement. But I think, you know, we do see that technology getting downstream like that more and more. Um, um, I, just, I think there'll be a long tail where it will gradually um, continue to turn electronic. Um, but, it, you know, it, it probably won't, it probably will not hit zero, but actually I don't think that's a bad thing to have a quotes downtime procedure, um, yeah. just in case of emergency. Sean, is there anything you want to add? We're almost out of time. I just didn't know if you wanted to give anyone any parting thoughts. Um, you know, you, you could take any, any scenario in mind who we're talking to. Let's, let's talk to CIOs out there and executive healthcare IT leaders who are just getting started. I think yeah, that's, I that's a good sweet spot. Yeah, don't, don't uh, reinvent the wheel. Don't do it alone. There are plenty of experts out there. I mean, these two alone could have written chapters on this. So um, reach out for help. There are good vendors out there. There are good colleagues. Chime Opiate Task Force, I'll put in a plug for that. Dick and I both sit on that. Um, great resources. We literally created a playbook for CIOs and CMIOs um, to help. And there's a whole action center with resources and links out to other, um, other resources. So um, just know that you have help. Reach out to any one of us um, and um, we can get you started and um, your colleagues can, can, can literally give you templates of, you know, uh, PowerPoints they've used, uh, dashboards they've created, and you can, you can customize them for your own use. So um, I, I think it is a, I think it is a, it's one of these triple threats where it's the right thing for the institution, it's the right thing economically. Um, you know, Dick didn't even talk about the ROI that he's achieved at at least one of his places that's, you know, in the millions of dollars per month um, by doing this positively, <laughs> you know, generating and, and cost savings. Um, and it's good for patients and, and providers, as we talked about. Prevents burnout, increases satisfaction, it's better for care, it's safer, it's more efficient. Um, obviously, I'm a strong proponent. Um, please contact us if you want more information. All right, very good. It sounds like uh, all positive there, all good stuff. Uh, regarding continuing education, you could use the final slide in this deck. You'll get an email when the on-demand version of this webinar is ready. Uh, if you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy from our team and you can go to our website to register for our upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our esteemed panel, Dr. Dick Taylor, Dr. Stephanie Lohr, Dr. Sean Kelly, and I want to thank Improvata for making this important conversation possible. And I want to thank you, our attendees. And with that, Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.